Good afternoon and good morning to those of you in a different time zone, and welcome to our discussion on migration in Europe, what trends to watch in 2018. My name is Natalia Banuescu bogdan and I'm the Associate Director of the International Program here at the Migration Policy Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome our three distinguished panelists today. First, we have Elizabeth Collett, who is the Founding Director of MPI Europe in Brussels. Um, second, we have Milan Nietzsche, who is a senior fellow in the Robert Bosch Center for Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia at the German Council on Foreign Relations, before which he led work on these regions at two prominent policy institutes in Slovakia. And then we have Pierre Vimont, currently a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe, who has led a distinguished diplomatic career with the French Foreign Service, serving as ambassador to the United States as well as to the European Union, among other positions. Before we get started and jump into the panel, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. The audio from this webinar will be on our website later today. You can find it at migrationpolicy.org forward slash events. If you have any problems hearing via the web link, uh, please dial in using the call-in information sent earlier via email. If you have any questions at all, just email events at migrationpolicy.org. And at the end, we're going to have a written Q&A, not a voice Q&A. Um, so please type any questions you have into the Q&A or chat box on the right side of your screen, or email events at migrationpolicy.org, or you can tweet your questions to at Migration Policy or hashtag MPI Discuss. Okay, so let's jump right in. Migration is obviously at the top of the agenda in Europe. The recent crisis exposed structural cracks in key European achievements, namely free movement and the European Union's apparatus for receiving and processing asylum seekers, where reforms uh, clearly have long been overdue. But the real complicating factor, and what uh, I think we're gonna dive into today, is that these problems not only lack technical solutions, they lack political solutions. And this is where things get thorny. There is little appetite for ceding more control to EU bodies, and cooperation among member states has been dealt a severe blow by widening philosophical divisions across the continent, which has played out in various ways. Migration, which some might call uh, the quintessential transnational policy challenge, uh, where uh, a little while ago we might have agreed uh, that no nation can handle it on its own, has actually had a paradoxical, paradoxical effect of forcing nations inward at precisely the moment where cooperation is most needed to solve common challenges. Um, it's unclear, to me at least, but perhaps not to our very smart panelists, what kinds of incentives can be put on the table to induce long-term and collaborative thinking around these issues. And as the EU struggles to get its own house in order, the stakes are high on the global stage. There's a window of opportunity right now to act collectively to get ahead of the next crisis and shape a new international migration framework, not to mention fill the leadership vacuum left by the United States. But this window will soon close. So today we're gonna to talk about how all this is likely to play out and where we can expect to see some progress over the next year. Here with us to help make sense of these interlinked events are the three premier experts I briefly introduced a moment ago, who will each tackle a slightly different part of the puzzle. We're gonna start with my colleague Liz Collett, Director of MPI Europe, who will give us a bird's eye view of trends to watch before we turn to the others. Um, and by the way, Liz has addressed some of these issues in a new MPI commentary published this week titled Borderline Irrelevant, Why Reforming the Dublin Regulation Misses the Point. Um, as this title perhaps suggests, she is going to start us off on a note of caution by outlining some of the blind spots facing European policymakers as they go into 2018. So Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Natalia, and I should emphasize that I am not capable of coming up with a title that clever all by myself, and I had quite a lot of help, um, though the content is all mine. Um, the goal today is to talk about what we might expect in Europe in 2018 in terms of migration policy, and I have to say, having looked at this over the last decade or so, I noticed that we tend to think in trajectories. Will 2018 be better or worse than 2017? Which in turn, was that better or worse than 2016 or 2015? 
The challenge is also, though, that over the past few years, uh, we have narrowed our focus and become monomaniacal on focusing on one particular aspect of migration in Europe, and that is specifically mixed irregular flows across the Mediterranean and how Europe can collectively manage them. It's narrowed our focus to the extreme short term. So perhaps one of our bellwethers for understanding whether things are starting to improve across Europe is whether we can start lifting our heads and start thinking long term um, about the next five or ten years in Europe, but also start bringing in some of those key issues that have perhaps been set aside over the past few years, the role that economic migration plays within migration management systems across the European Union, uh, thinking more uh, at a higher level about integration challenges and, and how to address them and not focusing in just so uh, specifically. Um, we talk a lot about whether we are post-crisis, whether we are between two crises, whether we are emerging into an era of chronic crisis where we are constantly reacting rather than preparing uh, for the next uh, presumed fluctuations in flow across the Mediterranean or elsewhere. Um, but I think it's safe to say that psychologically, European governments and European leaders are in a state, state of post-traumatic stress. They are extremely cautious. They have these heightened concerns about what may come, but they're not yet necessarily willing to take all the steps that make sense to ensure that they can manage next time around. There seems to be strong relief that currently the flows across the central Mediterranean and the eastern Mediterranean seem to be under control. There are some small rising concerns about changing flows in the western Mediterranean. Last year we saw flows double, even though those flows overall are a very small proportion um, of the total flows across the Mediterranean. Um, we are also concerned a little bit about the number of Tunisian nationals who have started to arrive from Tunisia, and there are some who are concerned that uh, the numbers of Turkish nationals themselves leaving Turkey may herald um, a, a change in situation in Turkey itself. Uh, should larger numbers of Turkish nationals uh, choose to uh, make the journey to Euro the European Union, I'm not sure the EU is quite prepared for that eventuality. Um, but European policymakers are starkly aware of the fragility of uh, the efforts they've made to manage flows across the Mediterranean. The state of EU relations with the Turkish government um, is not ideal, um, but its uh, ongoing management is, is of great concern. And uh, in March of this year at the summit, European leaders will decide whether to release the second payment of 3 billion euros, um, and that will be a crunch moment. Will the EU be able to find the money? Will they release the money to Turkey? And will that continue this process of managing the Eastern Mediterranean flows? Similarly, the Italian and EU interventions in Libya, in a context of constant shifts, deep complexity, and deep instability, with uh, implications for, for both migrants and, and, and Libyan citizens alike, uh, suggest that uh, this is something that may be sustainable in the short term, but it's, 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 it's extremely fragile in the long term. Um, for the Italian perspective, they just need to get past the elections in March. Um, but overall for Europe, I think there are deeper concerns about what might come next. Um, the International Crisis Group uh, issued its watch list uh, today uh, to sort of the countries around the world we should be keeping an eye on in terms of fragility and future conflict. They include countries like Ukraine, Tunisia, Egypt, the region of Sahel. Um, so it's clear that the neighborhood as a whole for Europe remains a, a, a complex and, and difficult one and something that European leaders keep, seem to keep a, a, a close eye on. Um, but there is a strange dichotomy within Europe between uh, both paranoia, uh, an almost neurotic fear of future migration flows and how to manage them, but also a certain level of uh, calm and uh, leadership that is sanguine about the fact that the crisis is over. And it's still unlikely, however, that the EU would be any better prepared for flows in the future than it is now. Um, however, it is pinning its hopes on a very specific type of reform of the Dublin regulation, um, specifically the incorporation of a form of relocation, the, movement, the responsibility sharing of asylum seekers across the European Union. Um, and they've set themselves a deadline of June for this particular reform. Um, this timetable is, is a tricky one and a necessary one. On the one hand, if the agreement isn't found before June, the EU institutions move into their last phase 
of um, the five-year term and the five-year political cycle. The European Parliament will start moving towards elections. Um, the European Commission will enter its, its, its more lame duck phase where it starts tying up uh, legislation rather than thinking about re-energizing a legislative agenda. But uh, between now and June, we see a number of political difficulties for key decision-making states across the EU. The German government is currently looking inwards, preoccupied with building a coalition in which immigration policy is a key contentious issue. They themselves have asked for the issue of relocation and Dublin reform to come last on the agenda just before June, uh, because I'm not sure they can develop a strong position prior to that point. In Italy, March elections, um, may or may not uh, offer clarity on the future direction of the Italian government or the future position of the Italian government. They themselves may be building coalition positions in the next months. Meanwhile, in Hungary, um, elections may further bolster a more, uh, a, a more negative attitude towards uh, refugee responsibility sharing within the European Union. But it's even questionable whether these ideas are useful and whether focusing in on Dublin reform makes sense. Um, there is little consideration as to why we are looking at these sorts of things across the European Union. Is this really about responsibility sharing or is this a broader question about how do we manage, um, how do we manage our area of free movement, the Schengen area within the EU as a whole? It's unclear that agreement in Brussels on uh, relocation as part of Dublin reform would either address the severe issues on the ground when it comes to managing asylum systems in many, in many countries across the European Union, or indeed give countries the reassurance they desire in, in sufficient enough to uh, remove the temporary internal border controls that we have seen creeping across the European Union over the, next, uh, over the last couple of years. We could end this year in a very strange place well, there are no major developments in policy, but a growing understanding between EU member states that a core element of the European project, the Schengen area, may not be able to continue in its current form and may be allowed to either subside or erode entirely. Elsewhere in Europe, you see member states already starting to price this into their policies. There is a continuation of a sort of national plan B set of policy shifts, whether it's the immigration reform being undertaken by Macron, um, the German extension of its tightened rules for asylum, also seen in Sweden um, and other countries across the European Union, a, a gradual tightening both of asylum systems and rules for family reunification, which suggests that countries themselves are not uh, convinced that the EU will find its solution, so they're making sure they have solutions of their own. Alongside this, you see quiet investments into the integration of those who have already arrived in Europe um, uh, with, with some nervousness about whether that whole process, that process will be successful. Other issues on the agenda this year, I think we will see continued interest in the idea of resettlement and legal pathways, both through very specific mechanisms such as the evacuation transit mechanism um, in, in Libya, evacuating people in detention centers to Niger or, or directly to the European Union, uh, and, and using that as a means to try and to reduce uh, the, the, the situation in Libya itself, or the broader commitment to increase resettlement across the European Union, particularly as part of the implementation of the EU-Turkey statement. It's understood that the European Commission has reached its, its, its stated ambition of, of having commitments to resettle 50,000 people over the next two years. This is an increase over, over, over commitments in previous years, but it's not a seismic shift. There are two risks to this. The focus, the focus on politically useful resettlement, specifically of Syrians from Turkey, or with indeed this, this Libya and Niger, Niger route, contrasts with the UNHCR's own identification of resettlement priorities, which look very different and highlight places such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, suggests an over-focus on those uh, resettlement uh, populations that are of specific political interest, geopolitical interest to the EU right now, may set aside populations um, that, that will have fewer opportunities in the, in the future and may take movement into their own hands. A second risk is that while it's easy to make political commitments to resettlement, 
ensuring that capacity exists at national level to build resettlement programs that are sustainable and manageable is, is very much a work in progress. There will need to be an enormous investment and a, a certain amount of uh, reflection to ensure that we don't have a boom bust where there is a, a huge commitment on resettlement that can't be followed through and therefore it's set aside as a failed policy idea. There are, is re a renewed interest in other types of legal pathways. We're starting to see the revival of the age-old circular migration concept, which is circular in its uh, recurring popularity every single decade. Um, and we see progress, small but very slow at the moment, towards trying to find ways of encouraging legal pathways for migration, for economic migration from, from different countries, but as I say, extremely nascent and um, extremely cautious. Um, another issue on the agenda for Europe over the next few months and over the next 18 months, in fact, will be looking at the money, um, and particularly the money in the European budget over the next seven-year policy cycle. Um, as I said before, the urgent question is whether the EU and its member states can find the three billion needed to um, adhere to the EU Turkey statement, um, which will be decided in March. But also there is the next multi-annual financial framework and negotiations about how much money the EU will have to spend in its next seven-year budget cycle and how much money it will spend on migration. Perhaps for those who've experienced um, the implementation of migration policy across the EU over the last couple of years, the bigger question is how to spend it better, how to ensure the right resources reach the right place in a manner flexible enough to actually meet the needs of both member states and those people who uh, the money is designed to serve. And finally, I think from a European perspective, there will be, I hope, increased emphasis on crisis response and learning, taking a moment to reflect Will the EU be able to do better next time around? Or with more fragile solidarity between governments and less public confidence and too little learning from the last three years, will we find ourselves quickly back in a situation of crisis? There is an urgent need to, to, to institutionalize those mechanisms that have been found to work in the last few years and to really think through how well the EU is prepared for sudden changes in migration flow. As a very final thought, as Natalia already uh, foreshadowed, there is a global compact process occurring uh, this year uh, within the UN system, the global compact on migration and the global compact on refugees. Um, the question of governance and leadership for migration at a global level has been uh, discussed for many years um, and comes back periodically uh, for, for, for further discussion. Um, this moment is particularly interesting because late last year the US government withdrew from the Global Compact on Migration, which has raised a question for the European Union. Does it want to follow quietly in the footsteps of Trump and withdraw from public leadership on migration at the global level, or does it want to fill the vacuum left behind by US withdrawal and lead and try to uh, build a more collaborative com conversation? Given the EU's renewed interest in the external dimension of migration and building migration partnerships with other countries, it may behoove them to perhaps think carefully about how to build longer-term cooperation um, at the global level that might serve their interests also at the regional level. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, for laying out this um, rather mighty tableau of challenges. Um, uh, where it's not a question of how do we throw more resources at some of these problems, but as you pointed out, we need a smarter deployment of resources, uh, which includes strong leadership at this urgent moment where we need to reach some consensus. Um, so on that note, um, uh, I want to turn to Milan in a moment um, for an in-depth look at some of the internal divisions uh, within Europe. Um, Milan, interestingly, you began your career as a broadcaster for Radio Free Europe, uh, witnessing the transition to democracy in parts of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, that and was now, a long time ago. A long time ago. We won't, we won't divulge <laughs> those details. Um, <laughs> um, and now, you know, we're in the situation where we see these Iron Curtain countries uh, experiencing a resurgence of nationalism um, and once again, you know, uh, seeking to distance themselves from the West. 
Um, so what is your prognosis for how these tensions between East and West might play out? Um, and are, is there anything kind of conducive to achieving consensus on some of the issues that Liz laid out? Before I come to um, what you're asking specifically about migration and, and maybe the Dublin regulation, a package that is on the table. Let me uh, make a general note that I don't think it's um, uh, the, the the upswing of populism. It's only a east-west uh, phenomenon or eastern phenomenon or something that is only about Central European Michigan countries. Um, I think it's an all-European disease that we can see manifested in elections in France last year, Netherlands, Austria recently, and I think where Central Eastern Europe. Um, is specific is that um, institutions and electorates of these countries are more vulnerable and, and more prone maybe to um, this kind of populism and fear mongering and also a linkage with migration and the threat of uh, uncontrolled migration makes it a, um, just a perfect mix for politician to play po on politics of fear and on the fear of these people. Um, so, but um, one one might when when looking at at the internal divides in the in the EU, um, let's see if it's only the Visegrad countries that that make noises and problems now on um, let's say resettlement. Um, there is also a new Austrian government with interior minister from um, from uh, extremist party. So I think the picture in um, uh, the political picture in Europe is moving, and what had what our our uh, viewpoints or our uh, frameworks from 2015 um, might not be um, uh, a good uh, a good ones now. If if on the other hand, if we if we look at what is on the table uh, in uh, in the EU, this uh, Dublin regulation. Um, I think there are there are pieces of it that that uh, where compromise is possible and where Visegrad countries um, would be on board. In in fact, if you take if you take um, a resettlement um, framework, um, let me make a note that uh, the uh, position uh, of the Council from from uh, autumn. Uh, sent to European Parliament was uh, um, passed in a uh, unanimous um, manner, so also with the, with the support of, of, of uh, let's say, Hungary. Um, Dublin, uh, where, where the, the, the Dublin is, a, is, is, is an issue of its own league, um, their political trenches are, I think, very deep and technical experts won't agree much. And we can later discuss maybe uh, maybe um, some 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 parts and elements of it. But I I would like to highlight one thing: uh, it's Bulgarian presidency now that came with a very ambitious agenda and a goal to close this um, uh, this this um, asylum uh, system reform and Dublin regulation reform by June 2018 because there is a pressure by given by political calendar. Uh, in Europe, as Liz, um, as, as Liz uh, explained, and also I think there is uh, there is a, a strong pressure from Germany and others on Bulgarians. But what is not um, um, what is not well known is that Bul Bul Bulgaria is not in 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 this portfolio is not um, with central other Central and Eastern European countries. It is a, a friendly country. And its own interests uh, overlap um, to a large extent with um, with the interests of Greece and Italy. Um, it uh, also doesn't want to um, be left uh, with the status quo and receiving a lot of um, a lot of asylum seekers pouring in from 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 Turkey, for instance. So it is also in in in, in uh, a Bul uh, Bulgarian self-interest to try to. To, to strike uh, an agreement which will be a very, very tough, uh, tough challenge uh, during their presidency. Thank you so much for uh, giving us the sort of insider look of where we are within the EU. Um, 
and there have already been some uh, great questions from our participants on the call that I'll direct to you in a moment. But first, I want to shift gears um, and take a moment to address uh, the external dimension. Um, we'll turn now to Pierre Vimont, who has firsthand experience with um, some of the foreign policy challenges uh, on the table right now, um, and particularly with one of the signature instruments being discussed, which is migration partnerships with neighboring countries. Um, mm -hmm. Pierre, <laughs> is this an area yes. where reality has perhaps fallen short of expectations? Where do you see some opportunities? Um, going back to what Liz was saying before, which was that uh, member states uh, were very much short-sighted on all these issues and looking really at the short-term uh, aspect of the immigration uh, challenge, namely how to control their borders. Of course, foreign policy and the external dimension of the migration issue uh, it has much more to do with long-term issues and, and therefore um, the, um, the EU members have so far uh, not been very active on, on, on this front. But yet, um, they have understood that if uh, they want to uh, find a solution to the overall migration issue, they have to look at the, uh, the root causes of, um, of the problem, which means uh, the whole issue of uh, lack of stability or lack of security uh, uh, in the home countries where migration is coming from. Uh, they have to look at the whole issue of the economic development in, in, in Africa, or even the challenges uh, with regard to the uh, environment and the climate change um, uh, consequences. So I think they have understood that something needs to be done there, uh, if only because Migration is a, is a very old challenge that uh, member states have had to deal with for, for many years. Think about Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia. Uh, this is not new. We have seen more recently um, uh, migration coming, of course, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from the Sahel country. Uh, but once again, the, 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 the challenge that Europe faced because of the uh, deep causes of migration have been there for a long time. Hence, the, the real problem that Europeans are facing today is how to cope with this, how to tackle these issues when we see that the record, record so far hasn't been all that good. Think about development assistance. Uh, Europe has been um, dealing with this for the last 50 or 60 years, the Lomé Convention, uh, the Lomé, uh, the Cotonou Agreements, etc., etc., and still we are looking at African countries which are desperately uh, looking for the right, uh, proper, well-balanced economic development. So it means that to a large extent European countries have to go back to the uh, working table and, and try to to, um, uh, to um, look at the right solution. I think personally that at the moment they have two different sets of uh, challenges they have to face. Uh, the first one is the, the short-term uh, challenge, namely how to bring back uh, security and stability uh, to the countries from where the migration is coming, be it um, political refugees or refugees um, of other categories. And here, of course, one thinks about Syria, one may think about Afghanistan or, or the Sahel countries. Uh, the longer term issue um, has to do with the whole issue of economic development in these countries. And this, of course, will take much longer to, um, to look at. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is that on both tracks, be it the short term or be it the long term, uh, we're still uh, far away from um, being able to come up with, uh, with the right solution. Think about Libya. Um, Libya, Europe, for the last uh, uh, four or five years, 
has been trying to uh, support the UN efforts and other efforts in trying to um, bring a stable government and a stable leadership in Libya. And so far, we haven't succeeded. Um, we're still facing two different groups of um, influential people who are bickering at each other and fighting each other, and we're still far away from a solution in Libya. Think about Syria, where at the moment all the efforts made by the UN, the Geneva meetings, or even the efforts made by Russia, the Sochi meeting that took place uh, uh, yesterday and the day before, are far from successful. So it is um, uh, a difficult task, and we're going to need much more time on this, I guess. As for the long term, it's true to say that um, development and development assistance needs to be totally um, renewed. We need new tools. We need new ideas. We need innovation there. We need to look at what are maybe today the most difficult challenges in terms of um, of uh, governance, in terms of uh, security, uh, in terms of uh, fighting corruption, in terms of how to create more cohesiveness in, in the societies in the Middle East or in Africa. Um, and therefore, uh, this new logic, this new paradigm um, needs time. Uh, um, furthermore, and I think this is maybe the most difficult question for the European Union, is who should be in charge? Should it be the EU institutions? Should it be the member states? Uh, as always, there has been some infighting uh, inside the European Union about who is really in charge. Uh, as you know, foreign policy has never been a very much integrated policy so far inside the EU, and you can still see that we are hesitating about who should take the lead on each one of these issues. Um, and um, there is a need for uh, a better understanding among the EU members um, and the EU institution uh, uh, about who's in charge and how to, to go ahead. You have on one side, if you take, for instance, all the um, current situation in the Sahel in relation with uh, Libya, Niger, Chad, and and, uh, and uh, Mali, uh, and Burkina Faso, you see that there is a sort of uh, competition between uh, the EU institutions who are setting up migration compact uh, and trying to find ways of um, improving the return and readmission um, uh, uh, agreement. Um, who are trying to see, as Liz was saying before, how you could set up resettlement schemes with the help of UN, uh, UNHCR or IOM. And on the other side, you see some of the member states who have a keen interest in, in the same area. Think about France, think about Italy, think about Germany or even Britain. Um, they are working on their own and also trying to set up um, um, the right the right process to deal with those migration problems. So I think at the end of the day, it will also be about uh, setting, uh, sitting around the table and trying to um, get a more orderly process in order to move along. So um, foreign policy, in my opinion, is going to be more and more in the forefront of the uh, migration agenda in, in Europe, maybe not with exactly the same strength or the same pressure as is the case for the future of the Schengen Agreement or the future of the Dublin um, asylum uh, rules. Uh, but still, I think everybody understands that at some point these foreign policy issues need to be dealt with and that um, the sooner would be the better. Thank you very, very much. Um, you, you mentioned one of the um, key challenges also that the, um, the goals of each of these actors um, are sometimes in conflict um, and the need for new ideas in the realm of development assistance um, does not always square directly with uh, European member states' goals of managing migration, just as one example. Um, We've got, uh, we've received um, a, a quite a lot of questions, um, so I want to give the panelists 
um, the opportunities to address as many of these as we can. Um, I want to um, go back to Milan for a moment as we've gotten some uh, questions about uh, the social inclusion of immigrants. So looking at the perspective of migrants themselves um, in, in Europe, um, what can we expect um, uh, in terms of um, the repercussions of, of some of these political challenges we've discussed, the rise of populism, anti-immigration platforms uh, that are very much alive in both East and West, um, and, uh, you know, what's happening with civil society institutions and uh, do you have some thoughts, basically, on uh, the social inclusion element? Well, look, uh, um, countries like Czech Republic and Slovakia are now reaching a, a, a new situation with uh, unemployment going down and the uh, economy booming. Uh, they have they have labor shortages in their automobile industry, for instance, and they are now <laughs> under pressure of of of, uh, um, of large um, 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 companies to urgently find um, um, skilled workers or schemes that can import um, workers in thousands. So. Uh, there is a new legislative initiative in the Slovak Parliament that would deal with uh, uh, um, uh, that would speed up um, all necessary changes, allowing uh, thousands of thousands and thousands of Ukrainians and Serbians to come to work in uh, Volkswagen and, and, and Peugeot factories in Slovakia uh, because there is lack of Slovak workers. So you have um, you have this. Uh, uh, pressures on on their economies that are um, that 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 are uh, growing too fast, um, and and there is still this um, negative attitude to economic migration as, as such and to to refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, so culture and economy is in clash uh, as these countries uh, grow and modernize um, in a fast uh, fast rate. Um, I would just say that civil society organizations are trying to do what they can. They are part of um, uh, public debates. In some of these countries, public debates are very lively. Um, and not in Hungary, where uh, the ruling party has, has um, taken the, the, the almost all media space and where um, refugees or migrants are portrayed as a, as a national threat to national security almost. But um, also in Czech Republic, where you had recently uh, uh, very heated up presidential elections, the end result was very narrow. 51% um, for anti-migration president uh, Milo Zeman, 49% for um, um, a more centrist liberal candidate. Um, who un unfortunately under the pressure of uh, Milo Zeman, who tried to turn the whole uh, election campaign on on um, refugees and mandatory quota, had to um, sort of give up on, on tolerance and had to also acknowledge that um, focusing only in the big file of Dublin that uh, he's also against the uh, mandatory red redistribution mechanism. What I want to say on this is that dividing lines within EU27 are numerous. It's not only East and West. Uh, it's true that the distribution mechanism is something unacceptable for uh, leaders of many countries in Central Eastern Europe, uh, especially those, especially uh, Visegrad countries. But there are also elements in this, as I mentioned, um, resettlement uh, framework. There are elements where uh, Visegrad countries um, are ready to strike a deal and I think what's important long term is to start from somewhere so that asylum um, uh, procedures and asylum system on the national level can be given a chance. And, uh, and that also um, what you are, what we now see happening in, in, in hundreds of people that there are asylum applications that are being processed, people are staying, that this can grow and, and also there is, there is a different kind of political communication about uh, this fear mongering that comes from from uh, from a nationalist part of political spectrum uh, 
so that people are not not afraid uh, that this will get out of control and that from that, that very very if these are small countries if you are a country of five million sometimes um, 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 there so sometimes it can be misused by 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 xenophobes saying that oh we can in ten years we can have a very different ethnic or or, or, or a religious setup of the country which is which is bullshit but uh, I think there is a lack of uh, there is too much emotions too much fears and this is also a sign of our era and still a lack of uh, fact based discussion about these long term phenomenon and frankly these societies were caught unprepared um, um, by 2015. Uh, to a large extent, by their own also mistake, they were not um, they were not open to discussing things before. Um, but um, now there is a lot of defensive attitudes and, and and a lot of I would say stereotypes. And at the same time, on the EU level, <laughs> somehow these countries, especially the Visegrad four countries, are are, are very useful sort of kicking kicking uh, uh, group. That uh, other countries that also have problems, for instance, with uh, stable or permanent responsibility for asylum seekers within uh, within uh, within uh, Dublin regulation, and uh, where, for instance, uh, in my reading of the situation, the the tension between north and south uh, within the EU is, is larger than between west and east. Sometimes uh, these countries hide comfortably behind uh, behind Visegrad and Viktor Orbán. Thank you. I think that's a, um, a very important point that the, the cracks that we are talking about um, in uh, Europe's efforts to forge more cooperation extend underneath all of Europe, um, and we can't always point to geographic dividing lines. Um, I just want to remind our listeners uh, that they can use the Q&A function on their screen or email events at migrationpolicy.org. Um, we can all, you can also um, use uh, Twitter um, and direct your questions to at Migration Policy or hashtag MPI Discuss. Um, and thank you to those who have already submitted questions. Um, I'd like to ask Liz to address one that has come up um, about Brexit. Um, and I'm not just picking on you uh, because you're British. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, speaking of um, seismic uh, political shifts um, on, the Euro on the European landscape, what's the effect of losing um, the UK on one hand um, in terms of a key partner, but also the impact on, um, on migration within the EU, on free movement, um, and the situation of EU migrants as well as uh, British expats? Um, well, speaking as a British national who is uh, both obsessed and exhausted by Brexit, um, I can say that it is a largely British preoccupation when it comes to European migration policy. Um, I think the free movement debate that sort of briefly revived last year was very much along the lines of, are there opportunities for other EU member states to make reforms to free movement? Um, based on their own smaller concerns about whether it's working or not. Um, and, and, and that had analogies also to, to a discussion on posted workers within the European Union. Um, more broadly speaking, though, I, it, it hasn't had an effect except on those governments who are concerned about the rights of their citizens living in the UK post-Brexit. That would be the sort of major concern is, is can we secure those? Um, in terms of losing the UK, as part of the European project and specifically EU migration policy. Um, several years prior to the referendum, I participated in a government assessment of the balance of competences between the UK and the EU on particular policy areas. And I participated in, in the sort of early stages of, of the discussion on free movement and the discussion on immigration and asylum. Uh, and what was striking about the discussion on immigration and asylum is it was very brief because the UK didn't opt in too many policies um, set by the European Union on immigration and asylum. It adopted out of most things, with the exception of Dublin, which had actually been working to the UK's advantage. So it was very uncontentious um, to, to think about the balance of competences between the UK and the EU, because it was very advantageous to the EU. It doesn't participate in Schengen. Um, it's opted out of most of the harmonization 
on immigration and asylum. So generally speaking, there isn't going to be much change for the UK on immigration outside of the free movement realm because they never were participating in it. I think what is interesting though is the extent to which the UK will formally or informally still want to participate in the EU's efforts to forge partnerships and collaboration outside the European Union. Um, the UK has been a key actor in dealing what it refers to as upstream flows, so trying to manage migration uh, at an earlier stage in the, in the journey. It has been um, a key voice in the Khartoum process in the Horn of Africa. It has placed a great deal of of financing in, in, in terms of its own partnerships separately from the European Union to encourage returns of, of nationals. Um, you know, I think the UK will still want to participate in some of this post-Brexit. Um, how it does so, I think, can be left fairly informal in the, certainly the short term. Um, one implication for the European Union, however, is that um, return statistics across the EU are aggregated. Um, and the UK is one of the uh, countries that has one of the higher return rates, and particularly to countries where it has strong relationships, Nigeria, Pakistan, and a couple of other countries. Um, one of the big impacts of the EU post-Brexit may well be that its overall return rate suddenly drops because it no, can no longer incorporate UK, UK statistics into that. And given the amount of political emphasis leaders are placing on increasing the number of people who are returned, um, from the European Union if they are found not to be in need of protection or they are found not to have um, a, a right to reside within the European Union may find that undermined by the simple exit of the UK from their statistical databases. Um, so I think there are some interesting side effects that will, that will emerge that perhaps haven't been fully, fully, fully considered by the EU. But on the external dimension, it will be interesting to see to what level the UK still, still participates in goals that are overall to their interest, um, whether or not they're members of the European Union. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, next, I'd like to bundle two questions that have come in uh, for Pierre to consider. Um, Pierre, you mentioned um, that we have old problems, problems that have been around for a long time and we need new solutions. Um, we've been talking about root causes um, for a long time. Um, and one question is, are there any new ways of thinking um, in the institutions or any new tools to drive innovation? Um, so that's one question. Um, and I want to also um, give you a question that came on Twitter. Um, should we consider climate fragility um, as an important new root cause? Two interesting uh, questions, certainly. On, on, on the first issue, uh, the, related to new solutions, um, I think there are and there is, as I was saying, a need for uh, for being more innovative and more creative um, on, on, on this. Uh, think, for instance, about the crucial role transit countries are playing more and more. Um, uh, of course, uh, one immediately uh, will mention Turkey or Libya, but think also about Morocco, who has been repeatedly a very important transit country for, for the European Union. And this may happen again, as we have seen recently an increase on the um, inflow of, uh, of migrants from, from Western Africa. Um, how to work in a better way with transit countries, uh, rather than just uh, uh, pushing, pushing back, and, and forcing them to keep in uh, in uh, reception centres um, uh, the migrants who are on their uh, on their ground on their territory. How to see how we could work together in a better way uh, to improve the situation of uh, the migrants uh, in transit countries, and to see how we could deal with that. With Morocco, uh, at uh, 10 or 15 years ago, when they had a huge problem of uh, migrants moving in, we managed to uh, think together about how we could try to improve the situation. Liz alluded to circular migration, which was at the time one of the possible solutions. Um, but there are other means of, of looking at this. For instance, in the last 
last year or so, uh, discussing this with Libya and also with some of the African countries uh, from where the migrants were coming, we have succeeded in improving the rate of return and uh, returns to um, countries in, in the Sahel or even below in Nigeria and elsewhere, uh, which is something we were not able to do before. Um, so there may be there with transit countries ways of um, of working together. Uh, let me give you another example um, with North African countries. So far, in terms of economic development, we have been mostly looking at the way these countries uh, could improve their trade or their economic links with uh, the North, uh, northern country, namely with uh, Europeans. But why not look also at other possibilities of economic development with their southern partners down in Sahel or in Western Africa or elsewhere? Here, Europe maybe could play a much more interesting role in helping North African countries in building up new economic links. Some of these do exist already. How to help um, uh, firms in, in Tunisia, Algeria, or Morocco to look more south uh, towards their south and towards their partners in, 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 in Africa. Uh, I think this could be also an interesting way of looking at uh, new resources, a new potential growth there that has maybe not totally been untapped uh, up to now. With regard to the second question, uh, climate fragility, yes, I definitely think, once once again, uh, let's not be surprised. This has already happened in the past. We had huge droughts uh, uh, about 10 or 15 years ago in Africa, and we have seen a, a huge migration movement at the time, uh, mostly towards other African countries, and by the way, this is still the case, 90% of migrants in Africa go to other African countries and not to Europe. Uh, but this may change as uh, climate fragility will become more and more of a structural uh, root cause of, uh, of migration, and therefore you may see more and more migrants uh, looking for a new possibility outside of the African continent and therefore going to Europe. But I would like only to focus on Africa. Think about Asia, uh, where also um, a lot of these uh, climate changes may occur and create, a, because of the rise of the sea level, a huge problem in some of those small islands in, in Asia or elsewhere, and therefore create a new source of migration that will have to be tackled as we move along. And just a quick follow-up to that, um, is there any potential that you see in some of the international or multinational processes for creating some of the innovation you described? So there was a specific question about the Khartoum and Rabat processes, and then of course uh, we've already mentioned uh, the global compacts process. Yes, I, I think it's always the same with the um, uh, multilateral system and the international community. I think there is an awareness of the problems we are facing. There are even a lot of uh, good ideas that are being uh, floating around. Uh, the issue is about action and how to um, to implement these uh, these interesting ideas. And therefore, you need money, first of all, and you need the political willingness to um, and the political will to go ahead with this. Or all too often, um, uh, developed countries, Western countries, are somewhat looking at their doorstep more than anything else, um, trying to push back uh, and to uh, defend uh, and control their borders. Uh, but not agreeing to be uh, to have more foresightedness and uh, more long term views about what needs to be done, and I think this is where the problem lies more and more. Well put, thank you. Um, I think we have time for uh, at least one more question. Um, Liz, um, I'd like to ask you to address a question that came in about 
aligning EU fiscal policies. Could this be a way to foster greater EU cooperation and stability um, and potentially increase the, the relevance of the EU on issues like migration? I am utterly ill-equipped to talk about EU fiscal policies. Um, so I don't know whether that would have any effect on their willingness to um, align on migration issues. Uh, I do think um, that we need to broaden out the conversation um, beyond purely solidarity and responsibility sharing um, on the asylum and migration issues and think a lot more about what it takes to build capacity um, within both in terms of national asylum systems, having the ability to, to receive uh, asylum seekers to be able to deal with newcomers uh, who have arrived for various different reasons, for the family or economic reasons, and, 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 and let's remember that's, that's still a significant proportion of migration to the European Union, you know, people coming to, to work or to join family or for other reasons, um, as well as starting to think about uh, immigration systems as part of a broader interconnected set of policies. Um, one of the major shifts, I think, of the past three years due in no small part to the sense of crisis that emerged in 2014-2015 in was the, 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 the beginning of a slow journey to start linking up different policies. Um, the one that, 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 that uh, Pierre has most been involved in it has been sort of trying to really think about how foreign policy can start to be utilized to, 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 to help the management of migration or to start bringing migration into foreign policy priorities um, where it was very low before um, and arguably a little bit too high now. Um, there are very, very tentative conversations about where trade um, it might, might become part of the conversation when it comes to partnership with third countries and, and other issues. Within the European Union, you now see conversations and, and, uh, about how um, broader social policies should be applied for the, for the integration of immigrants rather than just thinking this is a standalone policy. We are starting to make these connections to, to other policy areas. Um, and I think we have to continue along that journey to not see this as an isolated policy area that has to be dealt with in isolation by purely, purely migration specialists, as much as it pains me to admit that migration specialists can't answer every question. Um, and really start to, to, to understand what all the policy levers are to find um, a, a cooperative way of working within the European Union. Um, one of the things I think, and, and, and this may speak to sort of the, uh, understanding migration and, and, and the EU structures from a um, more economic perspective is, we have almost exclusively talked about Schengen over the last year as an area of justice and home affairs, which is how it was constructed, uh, and, and, and immigration and asylum policy as a, as a function of Schengen, um, creating convergence between EU member states in order to foster trust between EU member states to be able to, to, to maintain an area where there are no internal borders between those countries. Um, but this is also a, a, a success of the single market. It is a product of the single market. There are economic reasons uh, for, for, for maintaining Schengen as well as uh, just purely as a, as a principled element of the European project, and we have started to forget that. So I do think we need to start bringing together some of these very different conversations that we have in the EU, um, but uh, on the specific question of uh, fiscal policy, I, yeah, I'm definitely not the person to answer that question. Thank you, Liz. Well, I think you uh, eloquently described the system of incentives that are needed to induce um, some movement on these difficult policy issues. Um, looks like we just have one minute left in the call. Um, Milan, would you like to end perhaps on a, a note of optimism? Is there any bright spot that you see um, in terms of some of these conversations on reforms, um, perhaps um, picking up from where Pierre left off um, in terms of, you know, the need for actual action instead of just talking um, ad nauseum about the, the, the challenges ahead? Yes, I will try. Um... There, there was a 35 million 
uh, Euro agreement um, between Visegrad and Italy, uh, how to help uh, the plans in Libya uh, um, concerning uh, um, the structures on, on the ground to deal with, uh, with uh, asylum seekers there. And there is, um, I think, realistic hope for uh, some portions of agreement um, in the uh, in, in, in the whole package that is on the table during the Bulgarian presidency. So I think if uh, there will be a choice down the road before before June to either take some piece some portions that are agreeable or go for the for the whole thing. And on redistributive mechanism, I don't see political space for an agreement from from some Central and Eastern European countries. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all three of you for giving us so much food for thought. Unfortunately, our, our time is up today. Um, and I'd like to also thank all of the participants on this call uh, who asked great questions. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to quite all of them, though we tried to cover as much as we could. Uh, please remember to check out the additional resources on our website, including Liz's commentary on why reforming the Dublin regulation misses the point. Our website is uh, migrationpolicy.org. The audio from today's webinar will also be available online. Um, and for any reporters on the call who need more information, please call Michelle Middlestat at plus 44208-123-6265. Thank you so much.